Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Mini Lecture 7.1. Today, we're going to start our discussion of ethnicity in human geography by trying to answer the question, where are ethnicities distributed? Now, before we get started, we do need to make sure that we recall the difference between ethnicity and race. These are two terms that get commonly confused that do not mean the same thing. Now, the term ethnicity comes from the Greek ethnikos, which means national. Okay, Ethnicities typically are cultural in concept. They are made by the surrounding society. Typically, people from the same homeland who have distinctive cultural traits. That's ethnicity. Race is a biological issue. Okay, so people who share a common biological ancestor, that's their race. So please be careful not getting those too confused as we're going through. Just remember, ethnicity is cultural, race is biological. Ethnicity is cultural, and because it's cultural, which is why it's part of this particular unit here in human geography. For ethnicity, it helps derives the features of particular places where people are from, whereas biology doesn't explain how people live the way they do. Please make sure you know the difference between these two concepts as we're going forward. Now, in this chapter, we're going to start first by taking a look at the United States. And when we look at the U.S., just to give you an idea of the, the distribution of ethnicities within the United States, approximately 15% of the U.S. population is Hispanic or Latino. Now, we use both of those terms. Latino would be the more ethnically correct. African Americans or blacks make up 13% of the U.S. population, Asian Americans 4% of the U.S. population, and American Indians about 1%. So it's about a total of one-third of the current U.S. population. Based on current growth rates, going back to uh, Unit 2 when we talked about population growth, it's expected that the United States, by around the year 2040, will become what's known as a minority-majority country, meaning that there is no one group that holds over 50% of the ethnic uh, grouping of the entire country. So every group will be under 50%. That's expected by about the year 2040 if, if current growth trends hold. Now we'll start to see that kind of develop a little more over the coming years. Now, where are these, dis these groups distributed throughout the United States? A lot of it's based on migration. So when we look at the distribution of Hispanics in the United States, as you can see from the map, they are, for the most part, right along the U.S.-Mexican border. And then we have a population cluster in South Florida. Okay, These are areas where Hispanics have typically migrated into the United States when they first moved here. Now, of course, there's spread throughout the United States, but these are the areas with the heaviest concentrations. Now, for African Americans, again, their largest concentrations are throughout the South. When African Americans first came to the United States, it was through the South, through slavery. So as a result, you still have a large numbers of African Americans in these areas because after slavery was abolished via the 13th Amendment in 1865, you had a lot of African Americans who remained there. Now, we will talk about the migration uh, of African Americans out of the South, really to three main areas, and we'll discuss that a little later. For Asian Americans, for the most part, they're concentrated on the West Coast against an issue of migration. Most Asian Americans, when they first came to the United States, migrated to a city on the Western Coast. Okay, And of course, American Indians. For the most part, for them, it's not an issue of migration because they were here first. And as a result, they've kind of concentrated themselves in reservations that are spread throughout the uh, plains and Western states after they were uh, pushed west by the early American settlers. So these are our main groups that we're going to be starting from. Now, in terms of where ethnicities are kind of located, we really see a higher population of ethnicities within U.S. cities. Last check, we said that about 90% of African Americans and Hispanics live in cities. And a lot of this is because of chain migration. When people start migrating to one area, you start to see families and other groups of cultural groups move in that general direction. This is why we've seen in major cities you have specific ethnic areas that are going to be specifically one group or another group, whether it's Little Italy or Greek Town or uh, you know Little Japan or Chinatown or any of these groups that you'll see, especially in a major city, uh, Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, 
Um, you'll even see it in Miami, where you have Little Havana, which is a lot of the Cuban migrants to the United States who have moved to Miami have lived in that particular area near Calle Ocho uh, in downtown Miami. Remember, chain migration helps lead to ethnic neighborhoods, and this is where a lot of these areas have come from. Now, you can see this is still the case also when we take a look at ethnicities in both Chicago and Los Angeles. In Chicago, you see uh, a large population of African Americans, especially in the south side of Chicago, but you have a, lots of other groups, uh, Hispanics in multiple corners, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Cuban. Um, you have some of uh, Asian and other Eastern European descents all throughout the city, but you have major clusters in one area. If you look at Los Angeles, out further east, uh, in what's known as East Los Angeles, you have a much larger concentration of Hispanics living in those particular areas. So you start to see kind of a clustering effect in major cities as a result of this. Now, when we talk about African Americans in the United States, we need to talk about the three major migration patterns that both brought African Americans to our shores as well as distributed them throughout the country. And there are three patterns we need to know. The first pattern was during the 18th century, the uh, 17th and 18th century through slavery. The second was the post-World War II, or sorry, not the post-World War II, post-Civil War uh, distribution after the Civil War ended, African Americans moving throughout the country. And then we've seen the third, which is more of an intra-regional, which is a movement from inner city to other urban areas. Now, the first of those, of course, is uh, via the triangular trade, which you see in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, the triangular trade was a three-way trade route between Africa, North America, and Europe. Uh, via this trade, we had about 10 million African Americans who were brought to our shores uh, between around 1619, when the first slaves were brought over uh, to Jamestown, till about 1810, which is when it shut off. Now, the United States made it illegal to import slaves in 1808, but there was still another 250,000 that came in after that point. Now, as slaves came to the west from Africa, from here, raw goods and molasses, such as molasses would go to Europe, and from Europe, manufactured goods such as cloth would then go to Africa, and so on the trade would go. It's important for you to be sure that you know the triangular trade and how it basically functioned as we move forward. Okay. They started moving out from the south because they were a big, uh, helpful uh, push for agriculture in the south. Now, at the end of the Civil War, 1865, and through the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, coupled with the 13th Amendment, which made slavery illegal at the end of the Civil War, the releasing of African Americans from those bonds, what you started to see happen is that many African Americans incurred large debts, and they were forced to try and pay back those debts via the planting of cash crops. This was known as sharecropping, okay? And this would keep a large population of African Americans within the South. Now, beyond that point, we start to see some migration out of the South to the Northeast, the Midwest, and the Western states after uh, the post-Civil uh, War uh, reconstruction. And so, to this point, we start to see first movement to major cities and then spread to other urban areas outside of that. Now, as we've talked about, very important to make sure we don't uh, confuse ethnicity and race, and that race is something that's shared genetically, biologically. Um, biological classification into distinct racial groups is meaningless. For example, Asian is considered to be a distinct race, but there are many, many ethnicities. African American and black are not the same. There are many people who are of a black race who are not African American. They came from the Caribbean. So it should be noted uh, when we discuss that. Hispanic itself is not considered a race. Um, when we talk about racism and just the attachment of beliefs to these things, um, bear in mind that in the United States we have had a history of racism, going back af obviously after the Civil War to the uh, introduction of the separate but equal laws from Plessy versus Ferguson. With these led to the Jim Crow laws, which would later be overturned along with all other forms of segregation by Brown versus Topeka Board of Education in 1954. Uh, truth be told, there were three Brown versus Board of Educations. It actually took three separate cases before the Topeka Board would actually wise up and say, hmm, maybe what we're doing is wrong. Uh, so this, of course, overturned racism as a legal mechanism 
but we start still seeing effects of it outside of that. Uh, one of those is something called white flight. Uh, in Detroit specifically, the population of uh, Detroit, in terms of its ethnically white population, dropped by one million from 1950 to 1975. It dropped another 500,000 between then and the turn of the century. A lot of this also was due to something called blockbusting. Blockbusting is where real estate agents would convince outgoing whites who are trying to sell their property to sell at a very low price, and then they would sell very high to African Americans coming in. What this also had the effect of doing was improperly valuing the land, which unfortunately had the effect of dropping its value a lot when African Americans attempted to move in. This had an undue effect on the economy of economies of some of these large cities, including Detroit. Of course, the most uh, ugly viewpoint of racism and uh, anti-ethnicity was what we've talked about in South Africa with apartheid. Um, apartheid itself was the physical separation of races in South Africa that was actually put into law. Uh, when a baby would be born, they'd be classified into one of four categories, black, white, colored, or Asian. Um, colored meaning uh, mixing of two, any of two of the races. Each of these groups had a different legal status and as a result um, would be treated differently. Uh, the Afrikaners, who were the, uh, the major, uh, the more powerful Dutch, uh, the more powerful Dutch uh, entrance to the area, won those rights and created that uh, constitution in 1948, setting this up. As a result of apartheid, a lot of countries and a lot of groups, uh, Ford and GM, being two major companies that opt to do it, refused to do business with South Africa. It, you know, had, you had athletes who refused to compete with South Africa or in South Africa. Uh, as we're watching, as we're watching Invictus right now, you had some, uh, you had some areas and some groups who just refused to play the South Africans in anything, uh, rugby included. Uh, it went so far as the United Nations expelled South Africa from its membership because of apartheid. So this is one of those things that's not uh, a strong mark in South Africa's column. Now, eventually they will repeal uh, apartheid in 1991 under the leadership of F.W. de Klerk, who will also free Nelson Mandela, who will run for president and win the presidency in 1994. So blacks in South Africa are gaining much more political power, but they're not gaining the economic power, as whites are still 10 times wealthier than blacks uh, in South Africa at this time. So it's a gentle movement uh, towards equality. Politically, they're there. Economically, it's taking a lot longer. All right, and that's everything for Section 1. We'll be back with Section 2 a little later.